Chapter One of the House of Whispers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by April 6090, California, United States of America. The House of Whispers by William Lacroix. Chapter One The Laird of Glencardine. Why, what's the matter, child? Tell me. Nothing, Dad, really nothing. But you are breathing hard. Your hand trembles. Your pulse beats quickly. There's something amiss, I'm sure there is. Now, what is it? Come, no secrets. The girl, quickly snatching away her hand, answered with a forced laugh. How absurd you really are, dear old Dad. You're always fancying something or another. Because my senses of hearing and feeling are sharper and more developed than those of other folk, perhaps replied the gray-bearded old gentleman as he turned his sharp-cut gray but expressionless countenance to the tall sweet-faced girl standing beside his chair no second glance was needed to realize the pitiful truth the man seated there in his fine library with the summer sunset slanting across the red carpet from the open french windows was blind since his daughter gabrielle had been a pretty prattling child of nine nursing her dolly he had never looked upon her fair face, but he was ever as devoted to her as she to him. Surely his was a sad and lonely life. Within the last fifteen years or so, great wealth had come to him. But alas, he was unable to enjoy it. Until eleven years ago, he had been a prominent figure in politics and in society in London. He had sat in the house for one of the divisions of Hampshire, was a member of the Carlton, and one year he found his name among the birthday honors with a KCMG. For him, everybody predicted a brilliant future. The press gave prominence to his speeches, and to his house in Park Street came cabinet ministers and most of the well-known men of his party. Indeed, it was an open secret in a certain circle that he had been promised a seat in the cabinet in the near future. Then, at the very moment of his popularity, a terrible tragedy had occurred. He was on the platform of the Albert Hall addressing a great meeting at which the Prime Minister was the principal speaker. His speech was a brilliant one, and the applause had been vociferous. Full of satisfaction, he drove home that night to Park Street, but next morning the report spread that his brilliant political career had ended. He had suddenly been stricken by blindness. In political circles and in the clubs, the greatest consternation was caused, and some strange gossip became rife. It was whispered in certain quarters that the affliction was not produced by natural causes. In fact, it was a mystery, and one that had never been solved. The first oculists of Europe had peered into and tested his eyes, but all to no purpose. The sight had gone forever. Therefore, full of bitter regrets at being thus compelled to renounce the stress and storm of political life, which he loved so well, Sir Henry Hayburn had gone into strict retirement at Glencardine his beautiful old Perthshire home, visiting London but very seldom. He was essentially a man of mystery. Even in the days of his universal popularity, the source of his vast wealth was unknown. His father, the tenth baronet, had been sadly impoverished by the depreciation of agricultural property in Lincolnshire, and had ended his days in the genteel quietude of the Albany. But Sir Henry, without betraying to the world his methods, had in fifteen years amassed a fortune which people guessed must be considerably over a million sterling. From a life of strenuous activity, he had, in one single hour, been doomed to one of loneliness and inactivity. His friends sympathized, as indeed the whole British public had done. But in a month, the tragic affair and its attendant mysterious gossip had been forgotten. As in truth had the very name of Sir Henry Hayburn, whom the Prime Minister, though his political opponent had one night designated in the house as one of the most brilliant and talented young men who has ever sat upon the opposition benches in his declining years the life of this man was a pitiful tragedy his filmy eyes sightless his thin white fingers ever eager and nervous his hours full of deep thought and silent immobility to him what was the benefit of that beautiful perthshire castle which he had purchased from lord strathaven a year before his compulsory retirement. What was the use of the old ancestral manor near Caister in Lincolnshire, or the townhouse in Park Street, 
the snug hunting box at melton or the beautiful palm-shaded flower-embowered villa overlooking the blue southern sea at san remo he remembered them all he had misty visions of their splendor and their luxury but since his blindness he had seldom if ever entered them that big library up in scotland in which he now sat was the room he preferred and with his daughter gabrielle to bear him company to smooth his brow with her soft hand to chatter and to gossip he wished for no other companion his life was of the past a meteor had flashed and had vanished for ever tell me child what is troubling you he was asking in a calm kind voice as he still held the girl's hand in his the sweet scent of the roses from the garden beyond filled the room a smart footman in livery opened the door at that moment asking stokes has just returned with the car from perth sir henry and asks if you want him further at present no replied his blind master has he brought back her ladyship yes sir henry replied the man i believe he is taking her to the ball at conican to-night oh yes of course how foolish i am i quite forgot said the baronet with a slight sigh very well hill and the clean-shaven young man with his bright buttons bearing the chevron gules betwixt three boars's heads erased sable of the hayburns bowed and withdrew i had forgotten the ball at conican dear exclaimed her father stretching out his thin white hand in search of hers again of course you are going no dad i am staying at home with you staying at home echoed sir henry why my dear gabrielle the first year you're out and missing the best ball in the country certainly not i'm all right i shan't be lonely a little box came this morning from the professor didn't it yes dad then i shall be able to spend the evening very well alone the professor has sent me what he promised the other day i've decided not to go was the girl's firm reply i fear dear your mother will be very annoyed if you refuse he remarked i shall risk that dear old dad and stay with you to-night please allow me she added persuasively taking his hand in hers and bending till her red lips touched his white brow you have quite a lot to do remember a big packet of papers came from paris this morning i must read them over to you but your mother my dear your absence will be commented upon people will gossip you know there is but one person i care for dad yourself laughed the girl lightly perhaps you are disappointed over a new frock or something eh not at all my frock came from town the day before yesterday elise declares it suits me admirably and she's very hard to please you know it's white trimmed with tiny roses a perfect dream i expect remarked the blind man smiling i wish i could see you in it dear i often wonder what you are like now that you've grown to be a woman i'm like what i always have been dad i suppose she laughed yes yes he sighed in pretence of being troubled willful as always and and he faltered a moment later i often hear your dear dead mother's voice in yours then he was silent and by the deep lines in his brow she knew that he was thinking outside in the high elms beyond the level well-kept lawn with its gray old sundial the homecoming rooks were cawing prior to settling down for the night no other sound broke the stillness of that quiet sunset hour save the solemn ticking of the long old-fashioned clock at the farther end of the big book-lined room with its wide fireplace great overmantel of carved stone with emblazoned arms and its three long windows of old stained glass which gave it a somewhat ecclesiastical aspect tell me child repeated sir henry at length what was it that upset you just now nothing dad unless well perhaps it's the heat i felt rather unwell when i went out for my ride this morning she answered with a frantic attempt at excuse the blind man was well aware that her reply was but a subterfuge little however did he dream the cause little did he know that a dark shadow had fallen upon the young girl's life a shadow of evil gabrielle he said in a low intense voice why aren't you open and frank with me as you once used to be remember that you my daughter are my only friend slim dainty and small-waisted with a sweet dimpled face and blue eyes large and clear like a child's a white throat a well-poised head and light chestnut hair dressed low with a large black bow she presented the picture of happy careless youth her features soft and refined her half-bare arms well moulded 
and hands delicate and white she wore only one ornament upon her left hand was a small signet ring with her monogram engraved a gift from one of her governesses when a child and now worn upon the little finger the face was strikingly beautiful it had been remarked more than once in london but any admiration only called forth the covert sneers of lady heyburn why don't you tell me urged the blind man why don't you tell me the truth he protested her countenance changed when she heard his words in her blue eyes was a look of abject fear her left hand was tightly clenched and her mouth set hard as though in resolution i really don't know what you mean dad she responded with a hollow laugh you have such strange fancies nowadays strange fancies child echoed the afflicted man lifting his gray expressionless face to hers a blind man always has vague suspicious and black forebodings engendered by the darkness and loneliness of his life i am no exception he sighed i think ever of the might have beens no dear exclaimed the girl bending until her lips touched his white brow softly forget it all dear old dad surely your days here with me quiet and healthful in this beautiful perthshire are better better by far than if you had been a politician up in london ever struggling ever speaking and ever bearing the long hours at the house and the eternal stress of parliamentary life yes yes he said just a trifle impatiently it is not that i don't regret that i had to retire except well except for your sake perhaps dear for my sake how because had i been a member of this cabinet which some of my friends predicted you would have had the chance of a good marriage but buried as you are down here instead what chances have you i want no chance dad replied the girl i shall never marry a painful thought crossed the old man's mind being mirrored upon his brow by the deep lines which puckered there for a few brief moments well he exclaimed smiling that's surely no reason why you should not go to the ball at conachan to-night i have my duty to perform dad my duty is to re remain with you she said decisively you know you have quite a lot to do and when your mother has gone we'll spend an hour or two here at work i hear that walter murray is at home again at conachan hill told me this morning remarked her father so i heard also answered the girl and yet you are not going to the ball gabrielle eh laughed the old man mischievously now come dad the girl exclaimed coloring slightly you're really too bad i thought you had promised me not to mention him again so i did dear i i quite forgot replied sir henry apologetically forgive me you are now your own mistress if you prefer to stay away from conachan then do so by all means only make a proper excuse to your mother otherwise she will be annoyed i think not dear his daughter replied in a meaning tone if i remain at home she'll be rather glad than otherwise why inquired the old man quickly the girl hesitated she saw instantly that her mark was an unfortunate one well she said rather lamely because my absence will will relieve her of the responsibility of acting as chaperone what else could she say how could she tell her father the kindly but afflicted man to whom she was devoted the bitter truth his lonely dismal life was surely sufficiently hard to bear without the extra burden of suspicion of enforced inactivity of fierce hatred and of bitter regret so she slowly disengaged her hand kissed him again and with an excuse that she had the menus to write for the dinner-table went out leaving him alone when the door had closed a great sigh sounded through the long book-lined room a sigh that ended in a sob the old man had leaned his chin upon his hands and his sightless eyes were filled with tears is it the truth he murmured to himself is it really the truth End of chapter one chapter two of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two from out the night there are few of the perthshire castles that more plainly declare their feudal origin and exhibit traces of obsolete power than does the great gaunt pile of ruins known as glencardine its situation is both picturesque and imposing and the stern aspect of the two square baronial towers 
which faced the south, perched on a sheer precipice that descends to the Ruthven water deep below, shows that the castle was once the residence of a predatory chief in the days before its association with the great Montrose. Two miles from the long straggling village of Octeradar, in the centre of a fine, well-wooded, well-kept estate, the great ruined castle stands a silent monument of warlike days long since forgotten. There, within those walls, now overgrown with ivy and weeds, and where big trees grow in the centre of what was once the great paved courtyard, Montrose schemed and plotted, and according to tradition, kept certain of his enemies in the dungeons below. In the twelfth century, the aspect of the deep glen was very different from what it is today. In those days, the Ruthven was a broad river, flowing swiftly down to the urn, and forming, by reason of a moat, an effective barrier against attack. Today, however, the river has diminished into a mere burn meandering through a beautiful wooded glen, three hundred feet below. A glen the charms of which are well known throughout the whole of Scotland, and where in summer tourists from England endeavour to explore, but are warned back by Stuart, Sir Henry's Highland keeper. A quarter of a mile from the great historic ruin is a modern castle, built mainly of stone, from the ancient structure early in the eighteenth century. With oak panelled rooms, many quaint gables, stained glass, and long echoing corridors, a residence well adapted for entertaining on a lavish scale the front overlooking the beautiful glen and the back with level lawns and stretch of undulating park well wooded and full of picturesque beauty the family traditions and history of the old place and its owner had induced sir henry hayburn himself a fellow of the society of antiquaries to purchase it from lord strathoven into whose possession it had passed some forty years previously history showed that william de graham or graham who settled in scotland in the twelfth century became lord of glencardine and the great castle was built by his son they were indeed a noble race as their biographer has explained ever fearless in their country's cause they sneered at the mandates from impregnable stirling and were loyal in every generation glencardine was a stronghold feared by all the surrounding nobles and its men were full of valour and bravery one story of them is perhaps worth the telling in the year fourteen ninety the all-powerful abbot of incafre issued an order for the collection of the tins of the killerns land possessed by the grams of glencardine in the parish of monsbeard of which he was titular the order was rigorously executed the tens being exacted by force. Lord Killern of Dunning Castle was from home at the time, but in his absence his eldest son, William, master of Dunning, called out a number of his clansmen and marched towards Glencardine for the purpose of putting a stop to the abbot's proceedings. The Grahams of Glencardine, having been apprised of their neighbor's intention, mustered in strong force and marched to meet him. The opposing forces encountered each other at the north side of Knock Mary, about two miles to the southwest of Creef, while a number of the clan M. Roby, who lived beside the Loch of Balloch, marched up the south side of the hill, halting at the top to watch the progress of the combat. The fight began with great fury on both sides. The Glencardine men, however, began to get the upper hand and drive their opponents back. When the M. Robies, rushed down the hill to the succor of the killerns the tables were now turned the grams were unable to maintain their ground against the combined forces which they had now to face and fled towards glencardine taking refuge in the kirk of monsiverd the killerns had no desire to follow up their success any farther but at this stage they were joined by duncan campbell of duns stoffnodge who had come across from argyleshire to avenge the death of his father-in-law, Robert of Monsey, who, along with his two sons, had a short time before being killed by the Lord of Glencardine. An arrow shot from the church fatally wounded one of Campbell's men, and so enraged were the besiegers at this that they set fire to the heather-thatched building. Of the 160 human beings who were supposed to have been in the church, only one young lad escaped, 
and this was effected by the help of one of the Killerns, who caught the boy in his arms as he leaped out of the flames. The Killerns did not go unpunished for their barbarous deed. Their leader, with several of his chief retainers, was afterwards beheaded at Stirling, and an assessment was imposed on the Killerns for behoof of the wives and children of the Grahams who had perished by their hands. The Killern, by whose aid the young Graham had been saved, was forced to flee to Ireland, but he afterwards returned to Scotland, where he and his attendants were known by the name of Killern Aranek, or Ernoch, meaning Killern of Ireland. The estate which he held, and which is situated near Comrie, still bears that name. The site of the Kirk of Monsverd is now occupied by the mausoleum of the family of Murray of Octertir which was erected in 1809. When the foundations were being excavated, a large quantity of charred bones and wood was found. The history of Scotland is full of references to the doings at Glencardine, the fine home of the great Lord Glencardine, and of events, both in the original stronghold and in the present mansion, which have had important bearings upon the welfare of the country. In the autumn of 1825, the celebrated poetess, Baroness Nairn, who had been born of Gask a few miles away, visited Glencardine, and spent several weeks in the pleasantest manner. Within those gaunt ruins of the old castle, she first became inspired to write her celebrated Castle Gloom near Dollar. O Castle Gloom, thy strength is gone, the green grass o'er thee growin, on hill of care thou art alone the sorrow round thee flowing. O castle gloom, O oh, thy fair was, nay banners now are streaming. The howlet flits among thy haze, and wild birds there are screaming. O oh, mourn the woe, O oh, mourn the crime, for a civil war that flows. O oh, mourn, Argyle, thy fallen line, and mourn the great Montrose. The lofty ocules bright did glow, though sleeping was the sun, but morning's light did sadly show what rage and flames had done o oh, murk murk was the misty cloud that hung o'er thy wild wood thou wert like beauty in a shroud and all was solitude a volume indeed could be written upon the history traditions and superstitions of glencardine castle a subject in which its blind owner took the keenest possible interest but tragedy of it all he had never seen the lovely old domain he had acquired only by gabrielle's descriptions of it as she led him so often across the woods down by the babbling burn or over the great ivy-covered ruins did he know and love it every shepherd of the ochils knows of the lady of glencardine who on rare occasions had been seen dressed in green flitting before the modern mansion and who was said to be the spectre of the young lady jane glencardine who in seventeen ten was foully drowned in the urn by her jealous lover the lord of glamis and whose body was never recovered her appearance always boded ill fortune to the family in residence glencardine scarcely ever without guests lady hayburn a shallow and vain woman many years younger than her husband was always surrounded by her own friends she hated the country and more especially what she declared to be the deadly dullness of her perthshire home that moment was no exception there were half a dozen guests staying in the house but neither gabrielle nor her father took the slightest interest in any of them they had been of course invited to the ball at conniken and at dinner had expressed surprise when their host's pretty daughter the belle of the county had declared that she was not going oh gabrielle is really such a wayward child declared her ladyship to old colonel burton at her side if she has decided not to go no power on earth will persuade her i'm not feeling well at all mother the girl responded from the farther end of the table you will make nice excuses for me won't you i think it's simply ridiculous declared the baronet's wife your first season too gabrielle glanced round the table colored slightly but said nothing their guests knew too well that in the glencardine household there had always been and always would be slightly strained relations between her ladyship and her stepdaughter for an hour after dinner all was bustle and excitement then in the covered wagonette the gay party drove away while gabrielle standing at the door 
shouted after them a merry adieu it was a bright clear moonlit night so beautiful indeed that twisting a shawl about her shoulders she went to her father's den where he usually smoked alone and taking his arm led him out for a walk into the park over that gravel drive where upon such nights as that twas said that the unfortunate lady jane could be seen when alone the sightless man could find his way quite well with the aid of his stick he knew every inch of his domain indeed he could descend from the castle by the winding path that led deep into the glen and across the narrow foot bridges of the rushing ruth van water or he could traverse the most intricate paths through the woods by means of certain landmarks which only he himself knew he was ever fond of wandering about the estate alone and often took solitary walks on bright nights with his stout stick tapping before him on rare occasions however when in the absence of her ladyship he enjoyed the company of pretty gabrielle they would wander in the park arm in arm chatting and exchanging confidences the departure of their house party had lifted a heavy weight from both their hearts it would be dawn before they returned she loved her father and was never happier than when describing to him things the smallest objects sometimes which he himself could not see as they strolled on beneath the shadows of the tall elms the stillness of the night was broken only by the quick scurry of a rabbit into the tall bracken or the harsh cry of some night bird startled by their approach before them standing black against the night sky rose the quaint ponderous but broken walls of the ancient stronghold where an owl hooted weirdly in the ivy and where the whispering of the waters rose from the deep below it's a pity dear that you didn't go to the dance the old man was saying her arm held within his own you've annoyed your mother i fear mother is quite happy with her guests dad while i am happy with you she replied softly therefore why discuss it but surely it is not very entertaining for you to remain here with a man who is blind remember you are young and these golden days of youth will very soon pass why you always entertain and instruct me dad she declared from you i've learnt so much archaeology and so much about medieval seals that i believe i am qualified to become a fellow of the society of antiquaries if women were admitted to the fellowship they will be one day my dear if the suffragettes are allowed their own way he laughed and then during the full hour they strolled together their conversation mostly consisted of questions asked by her father concerning some improvements being made in one of the farms which she had visited on the previous day and her description of what had been done the stable clock had struck half past ten on its musical chimes before they re-entered the big hall and being relieved by hill of the raps passed together into the library where from a locked cabinet in a corner gabrielle took a number of business papers and placed them upon the writing-table before her father no he said running his thin white hands over them not business to-night dear but pleasure where is that box from the professor it's here dad shall i open it yes he replied the dear old fellow never forgets an old friend never a seal finds its way into the collection at cambridge but he first sends it to me for examination before it is catalogued he knows what pleasure it is to me to decipher them and make out their history almost alas the only pleasure left to me except you my darling professor moyes adopts your opinion always dad he knows as every other antiquary knows that you are the greatest living authority on the subject which you have made a lifetime study that of the bronze seals of the middle ages ah oh, sighed the old man if i could only write my great book it is the pleasure debarred me years ago i started to collect material but my affliction came and now i can only feel the matrices and picture them in my mind i see through your eyes dear gabrielle to me the world i loved so much is only a blank darkness with your dear voice sounding out of it the only voice my child that is music to my ears the girl said nothing she only glanced at the sad expressionless face and cutting the string of the small packet displayed three bronze seals two oval about two inches long and the third round about one inch in diameter and each with a small kind of handle on the reverse with them were sulphur casts or impressions taken from them 
ready to be placed in the museum at cambridge the old man's nervous fingers traveled over the surfaces quickly an expression of complete satisfaction in his face have you the magnifying glass dear tell me what you make of the inscriptions he said at the same time carefully feeling the curious medieval lettering of one of the casts at the same instant she started rose quickly from her chair and held her breath a man tall dark-faced and wearing a thin black overcoat had entered noiselessly from the lawn by the open window and stood there with his finger upon his lips indicating silence then he pointed outside with a commanding gesture that she should follow her eyes met his in a glance of fierce resentment and instinctively she placed her hand upon her breast as though to stay the beating of her heart again he pointed in silent authority and she as though held in some mysterious thraldom made excuse to the blind man and rising followed in his noiseless footsteps End of chapter two Chapter three of the House of Whispers by William Lacroix This Librivox recording is in the public domain Seals of Destiny Ten minutes later she returned, panting, her face pale and haggard, her mouth hard set. For a moment she stood in silence upon the threshold of the open doors leading to the grounds her hand pressed to her breast in a strenuous endeavor to calm herself she feared that her father might detect her agitation for he was so quick in discovering in her the slightest unusual emotion she glanced behind her with an expression full of fear as though dreading the reappearance of that man who had compelled her to follow him out into the night then she looked at her father who still seated motionless with his back to her was busy with his fingers upon something on the blotting pad before him in that brief absence her countenance had entirely changed she was pale to the lips with drawn brows while about her mouth played a hard bitter expression as though her mind were bent upon some desperate resolve that the man who had come there by stealth was no stranger was evident yet that between them was some deep-rooted enmity was equally apparent nevertheless he held her irresistibly within his toils his clean-shaven face was a distinctly evil one his eyes were set too close together and in his physiognomy was something unscrupulous and relentless he was not the man for a woman to trust she stepped back from the threshold and for a few seconds halted outside her ears strained to catch any sound then as though reassured she pushed the chestnut hair from her hot fevered brow held her breath with strenuous effort and re-entering the library advanced to her father's side i wonder where you had gone dear he said in his low calm voice as he detected her presence i hoped you would not leave me for long for it is not very often we enjoy an evening so entirely alone as to-night leave you dear old dad of course not she laughed gaily as though nothing had occurred to disturb her peace of mind we were just about to look at those seals professor moyes sent to you to-day weren't we here they are and she placed them before the helpless and afflicted man endeavouring to remain undisturbed and taking a chair at his side as was her habit when they sat together yes he said cheerfully let us see what they are the first of the yellow sulphur casts which he examined bore the full-length figure of an abbot with mitre and crochet in the act of giving his blessing behind him were three circular towers with pointed roofs surmounted by crosses while around in bold early gothic letters ran the inscription s benedi abitis santi ambrosi de rancia slowly and with great care his fingers travelled over the raised letters and design of the oval cast then having also examined the battered old bronze matrix he said a most excellent specimen and in first-class preservation too i wonder where it has been found in italy without doubt what do you make it out to be dad asked the girl seated in the chair at his side and as interested in the little antiquity as he was himself thirteenth century my dear early thirteenth century he declared without hesitation genuine quite genuine no doubt the matrix shows signs of considerable wear is there much patina upon it he asked she turned it over displaying the thick green corrosion 
which bronze acquires only by great age yes quite a lot dad the raised portion at the back is pierced by a hole very much worn worn by the thong by which it was attached to the girdle of successive abbots through centuries he declared from its inscription it is the seal of the abbot benedict of the monastery of st ambrose of rancia in lombardy let me think now we should find the history of that house probably in sassolini's memorials will you get it down dear top shelf of the fifth case on the left though blind he knew just where he could put his hand upon all his most cherished volumes and woe betide any one who put a volume back in its wrong place gabrielle rose and obtaining the steps reached down the great leather-bound quattro book which he carried to a reading desk and at once searched the index the work was in italian a language which she knew fairly well and after ten minutes or so during which time the blind man continued slowly to trace the inscription with his fingertips she said here it is dad rancia near cremona the religious brotherhood was founded there in eleven thirty two and the abbot benedict was third abbot from twelve eighteen to twelve thirty one the church still exists the magnificent pulpit in marble embellished with mosaics presented in twelve seventy two rests on six columns supported by lions with an inscription nicholas de montava memorius hoc opus visit opposite it is the ambo twelve seventy two in a simple style with a representation of jonah being swallowed by a whale in the choir is the throne adorned by mosaics and the capella di san pantalone contains the blood of the saint together with some relics of the abbot benedict the cloisters still exist though of course the monastery is now suppressed and this remarked sir henry turning over the old bronze seal in his hand belonged to the abbot ambrose six hundred and fifty years ago and yes dad declared the girl returning to his side and taking the matrix herself to examine it under the green shaded reading lamp the study of seals is most interesting it carries one back into the dim ages i hope the professor will allow you to keep these casts for your collection yes i know he will responded the old baronet he is well aware what a deep interest i take in my hobby and also that you are one of the first authorities in the world upon the subject added his daughter the old man sighed would that he could see with his eyes once again for after all the sense of touch was but a poor substitute for that of sight he drew towards him the impression of the second of the oval seals the center was divided into two portions above was the half-length figure of a saint holding a closed book in his hand and below was a youth with long hands in the act of adoration between them was a scroll upon which was written s c martin opn while around the seal were the wards in gothic characters seigel henrique flibane didolch this is fourteenth century pronounced the baronet and is from dulcigno on the adriatic the seal of henry the vicar of the church of that place from the engraving and style he said still fingering it with great care now and then turning to the matrix in order to satisfy himself i should place it as having been executed about thirteen fifty but it is really a very beautiful specimen done at a time when the art of seal engraving was at its height no engraver could to-day turn out a more ornate and at the same time bold design moyes is really very fortunate in securing this you must write my dear and ask him how these latest treasures came into his hands at his request she got down another of the ponderous volumes of sassolini from the high shelf and read to him translating from the italian the brief notice of the ancient church of dolcigno which it appeared had been built in the lombard norman style of the eleventh century while the campanile with columns from pastum dated from twelve seventy six the third seal the circular one was larger than the rest being quite two inches across in the center of the top half was the madonna with child seated a male and female figure on either side below were three female figures on either side the two scenes being divided by a festoon of flowers while around the edge ran in somewhat more modern characters those of the early sixteenth century the following sigilvum vicaris generalis ordinis Vieta, maria de mon carmel this declared sir henry after long and most minute examination is a treasure probably unequalled in the collection at cambridge 
being the actual seal of the vicar general of the carmelite order its date i should place at about eleven fifty look well dear at those flower garlands how beautifully they are engraved seal making is alas to-day a lost art we have only crude and heavy attempts the company seal seems to-day the only thing the engraver can turn out those machines which emboss upon a big red wafer and his busy fingers were continuously feeling the great circular bronze matrix and a moment afterwards its sulphur cast he was an enthusiastic antiquary and long ago in the days when the world was light had read papers before the society of antiquaries at burlington house upon medieval seals and upon the early latin codices nowadays however gabrielle acted as his eyes and so devoted was she to her father that she took a keen interest in his dry-as-dust hobbies so that after his long tuition she could decipher and read a twelfth-century latin manuscript on its scrap of yellow crinkled parchment and with all its puzzling abbreviations almost as well as any professor of paleography at the universities while inscriptions upon gothic seals were to her as plain as a paragraph in a newspaper more than once white-haired spectacled professors who came to glencardine as her father's guests were amazed at her intelligent conversation upon points which were quite abstruse indeed she had no idea of the remarkable extent of her own antiquarian knowledge all of it gathered from the talented man whose affliction had kept her so close at his side for quite an hour her father fingered the three seal impressions discussing them with her in the language of a savant she herself examined them minutely and expressed opinions now and then she glanced apprehensively to that open window he pointed out to her where she was wrong in her estimate of the design of the circular one explaining a technical and little-known detail concerning the seals of the carmelite order from the window a cool breath of the night wind came in fanning the curtains and carrying with it the sweet scent of the flowers without how refreshing exclaimed the old man drawing in a deep breath the night is very close gabrielle dear i fear we shall have thunder there was lightning only a moment ago explained the girl shall i put the cast into your collection dad yes dear moise no doubt intends that i should keep them gabrielle rose and passing across to a large cabinet with many shallow drawers she opened one displaying a tray full of casts of seals each neatly arranged with its inscription and translation placed beneath all in her own clear handwriting some of the drawers contain the matrices as well as the casts but as matrices of medieval seals are rarities and seldom found anywhere save in the chief public museums it is no wonder that the bulk of private collections consists of impressions presently at the baronet's suggestion she closed and locked the cabinet and then took up a bundle of business documents which she commenced to sort out and arrange she acted as her father's private secretary and therefore knew much of his affairs but many things were to her a complete mystery be it said though devoted to her father she nevertheless sometimes became filled with a vague suspicion that the source of his great income was not altogether an open and honest one the papers and letters she read to him often contained veiled information which sorely puzzled her and which caused her many hours of wonder and reflection her father lived alone with only her as companion her stepmother a young good-looking and giddy woman never dreamed the truth what would she do how would she act gabrielle wondered if ever she gained sight of some of those private papers kept locked in the cavity beyond the black steel door concealed by the false bookcase at the farther end of the fine old restful room the papers she handled had been taken from the safe by sir henry himself and they contained a man's secret end of chapter three Chapter Four of the House of Whispers by William Lacroix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Something concerning James Flockhart. In the spreading dawn, the house party had returned from Conacan and had ascended to their rooms. Weary with the night's revelry, the men with shirt fronts crumpled and ties awry, the women with hair disordered, and in some cases with flimsy skirts torn in the mazes of the dance yet all were merry and full of satisfaction at what one young man from town had declared to be an awfully ripping evening 
all retired at once all save the hostess and one of her male guests the man who had entered the library by stealth earlier in the evening and had called gabrielle outside lady hayburn and her visitor james flockhart had managed to slip away from the others and now stood together in the library into which the grey light of dawn was at that moment slowly creeping he drew up one of the blinds to admit the light and there away over the hills beyond the glen showed the red flush that heralded the sun's coming then returning to where stood the young and attractive woman in pale pink chiffon with diamonds on her neck and a star in her fair hair he looked her straight in the face and asked well and what have you decided she raised her eyes to his but made no reply she was hesitating the gems upon her were heirlooms of the hayburn family and in that gray light looked cold and glassy the powder and the slight touch of carmine upon her cheeks which at night had served to heighten her beauty now gave her an appearance of painted artificiality she was undeniably a pretty woman and surely required no artificial aids to beauty about thirty-three yet she looked five years younger while her husband was twenty years senior to herself she still retained a figure so girlish that most people took her for gabrielle's elder sister while in the matter of dress she was admitted in society to be one of the leaders of fashion her hair was of that rare copper-gold tint her features regular with a slightly protruding chin soft eyes and cheeks perfect in their contour society knew her as a gay reckless giddy woman who regardless of the terrible affliction which had fallen upon the brilliant man who was her husband surrounded herself with the circle of friends of the same type as herself and who thoroughly enjoyed her life regardless of any gossip or of the malignant statements by women who envied her men were fond of winnie hayburn as they called her and always voted her good fun they pitied poor sir henry but after all he was blind and preferred his hobbies of collecting old seals and dusty parchment manuscripts to dances bridge parties theatres arrow shows at ranelagh and suppers at the carlton or savoy like most wealthy women of her type she had a wide circle of male friends younger men declared her to be a real pal and with some of the older beaux she would flirt and be amused by their flattering speeches gabrielle's mother the second daughter of lord buckhurst had been dead several years when the brilliant politician met his second wife at a garden party at dollis hill she was daughter of a man named lambert a paper manufacturer who acted as political agent in the town of bedford and she was therefore essentially a country cousin her beauty was however remarked everywhere the baronet was struck by her and within three months they were married at st george's hanover square the world congratulating her upon a very excellent match from the very first however the difference in the ages of husband and wife proved a barrier ere the honeymoon was over she found that her husband tied by his political engagements and by his eternal duties at the house was unable to accompany her out of an evening hence from the very first they had drifted apart until eight months later the terrible affliction of blindness fell upon him for a time this drew her back to him she was his constant and dutiful companion everywhere leading him hither and thither and attending to his wants but very soon the tie bored her and the attractions of society once again proved too great hence for the past nine years gabrielle being at school first at eastbourne and afterwards at amiens she had amused herself and left her husband to his dry-as-dust hobbies and the loneliness of his black and sunless world the man who had just put that curious question to her was perhaps her closest friend to her he owed everything though the world was in ignorance of the fact that they were friends everybody knew indeed they had been friends years ago in bedford before her marriage for james was the only son of the rev henry flockhart vicar of one of the parishes in the town people living in bedford recollected that the parson's son had turned out rather badly and had gone to america but a year or two after that the quiet-mannered old clergyman had died 
the living had been given to a successor and bedford knew the name of flockhart no more after winifred's marriage however london society or rather a gay section of it became acquainted with james flockhart who lived at ease in his pretty bachelor rooms in half moon street and who soon gathered about him a large circle of male acquaintances sir henry knew him and raised no objection to his wife's friendship towards him they had been boy and girl together therefore what more natural than that they should be friends in later life in her school days gabrielle knew practically nothing of this man but now she had returned to be her father's companion she had met him and had bitter cause to hate both him and lady heyburn it was her own secret she kept it to herself she hid the truth from her father from every one she watched closely and in patience one day she would speak and tell the truth until then she resolved to keep to herself all that she knew well asked the man with the soft pleated shirt front and white waistcoat smeared with cigarette ash what have you decided he asked again i've decided nothing was her blank answer but you must don't be a silly fool he urged you've surely had time to think over it no i haven't the girl knows nothing so what have you to fear he endeavoured to assure her lady heyburn shrugged her shoulders how can you prove that she knows nothing oh she has eyes for nobody but the old man he laughed to-night is an example why she wouldn't come to conican even though she knew that walter was there she preferred to spend the evening here with her father she's a little fool of course jimmy replied the woman in pink but perhaps it was as well that she didn't come i hate to have to chaperone the chit it makes me look so horribly old i wish to goodness the girl was out of the way he declared she's sharper than we think and by jove if she ever did know what was in progress it would be all up for both of us wouldn't it who think of it if i had thought she had the slightest suspicion declared her ladyship with the sudden hardness of her lips i'd i'd close her mouth very quickly and forever eh he asked meaningly yes forever bah he laughed you'd be afraid to do that my dear winnie added the man lowering his voice your husband is blind it's true but there are other people in the world who are not recollect gabrielle is now nineteen she has her eyes open she's the eyes and ears of sir henry not the slightest thing occurs in this household but it is told to him at once his indifference to all is only a clever pretense what she gasped quickly do you think he suspects pray what can he suspect asked the man very calmly both hands in his trouser pockets as he leaned back against the table in front of her he can only suspect things which his daughter knows she said but what does she know what can she know he asked how can we tell i have watched but can detect nothing i am however suspicious because she did not come to conican with us to-night why walter murray may know something and may have told her if so then to close her lips would be useless it would only bring a heavier responsibility upon us and but he hesitated without finishing his sentence his meaning was apparent from the wry face she pulled at his remark he did not tell her how he had while she had been dancing and flirting that night made his way back to the castle or how he had compelled gabrielle to go forth and speak with him his action had been a bold one yet its result had confirmed certain vague suspicions he had held well he knew that the girl hated him heartily and that she was in possession of a certain secret of his one which might easily result in his downfall he feared to tell the truth to this woman before him for if he did so she would certainly withdraw from all association with him in order to save herself the key to the whole situation was held by that slim sweet-faced girl so devoted to her afflicted father he was not quite certain as to the actual extent of her knowledge and was as yet undecided as to what attitude he should adopt towards her he stood between the baronet's wife and his daughter and he hesitated in which direction to follow what did she really know he wondered had she overheard any of that serious conversation between lady heyburn and himself while they walked together in the glen on the previous evening 
such a contretemps was surely impossible for he remembered they had taken every precaution lest even stuart the head gamekeeper might be about in order to stop trespassers who attracted by the beauties of glencardine tried to penetrate and explore them and by doing so disturbed the game and if the girl really knows he asked of the woman who stood there motionless gazing out across the lawn fixedly towards the dawn if she knows james she said in a hard decisive tone then we must act together quickly and fearlessly we must carry out that that plan you proposed a year ago you are quite fearless then he asked looking straight into her fine eyes fearless of course i am she answered unflinchingly we must get rid of her providing we can do so without any suspicion falling upon us you seem to have become quite white-livered she exclaimed to him with a harsh derisive laugh you were not so a year ago in the other affair his brows contracted as he reflected upon all it meant to him the girl knew something therefore to seal her lips was imperative for their own safety she was their enemy you are mistaken he answered in a low calm voice i am just as determined just as fearless as i was then and you will do it she asked if it is your wish he replied simply good give me your hand we are agreed it shall be done and the man took the slim white hand the woman held out to him and a moment later they ascended the great oak staircase to their respective rooms the pair were in accord the future contained for gabrielle hayburn asleep and all unconscious of the dastardly conspiracy only that which must be hideous tragic fatal End of chapter 4chapter five of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain the murrays of conacan elise lady hayburn's french maid discovered next morning that an antique snake bracelet was missing a loss which occasioned great consternation in the household breakfast was late and at table when the loss was mentioned gabrielle offered to drive over to conacan in the car and make inquiry and search the general opinion was that it had been dropped in one of the rooms and was probably still lying there undiscovered the girl's offer was accepted and half an hour later the smaller of the two glencardine cars the sixteen fiat was brought round to the door by stokes the smart chauffeur young galatee fresh down from oxford begged to be allowed to go with her and his escort was accepted then in motor cap and champagne colored dust veil gabrielle mounted at the wheel with the young fellow at her side and stokes in the back and drove away down the long avenue to the high road the car was her delight never so happy was she as when wrapped in her leather-lined motor coat she drove the sixteen the six-cylinder sixty was too powerful for her but with the sixteen she ran half over scotland and was quite a common object on the perth too stirling road possessed of nerve and full of self-confidence she could negotiate traffic in edinburgh or glasgow and on one occasion had driven her father the whole way from glencardine up to london a distance of four hundred and fifty miles her fingers pressed the button of the electric horn as they descended the sharp incline to the lodge gates and turning into the open road and was soon speeding along through octeradar village to labardine wood down through Braco, and along by the nake water and st patrick's well into glen artney passing under the dark shadow of dundurn until there came into view the broad waters of loch urn the morning was bright and cloudless and at such a pace they went that a perfect wall of dust stood behind them from the margin of the loch the ground rose for a couple of miles until it reached a plateau upon which stood the fine imposing priory the ancestral seat of the murrays of conacan the aspect as they drove up was very imposing the winding road was closely planted with trees for a large portion of its course and the stately front of the western entrance with its massive stone portico and crenulated cornice burst unexpectedly upon them from that point of view one seemed to have reached the gable end of a princely edifice crowned with gothic belfries yet on looking round it was seen that, that the approach by which the doorway had been reached was lined on one side 
with buildings hidden behind the clustering foliage and through the archway on the left one caught a glimpse of the ivy-covered clock tower and spacious stable-yard and garage extending northwards for a considerable distance gabrielle ran the car round to the south side of the house where in the foreground were the well-kept parks of conican the smooth-shaven lawn fringed with symmetrically planted trees and the fertile fields extending away to the very brink of the loch the original fortalice of the muries half a mile distant was like glencardine a ruin the present priory notwithstanding its old-fashioned towers and lancet windows was a comparatively modern structure and the ivy which partially covered some of the windows could claim no great antiquity yet the general effect of the architectural grouping was most pleasing and might well deceive the visitor or tourist into the supposition that it belonged to a very remote period it was as a matter of fact the work of atkinson who in the first years of the nineteenth century built scone abbotsford and taymouth castle with loud warning blasts upon the horn gabrielle hayburn pulled up but ere she could descend walter murray a good-looking dark-haired young man in gray flannels and hatless was outside hailing her with delight hello gabrielle he cried cheerily taking her hand what brings you over this morning especially when we were told last night that you were so very ill the illness has passed exclaimed young gellity shaking his friend's hand and we're now in search of a lost bracelet one of lady hayburn's why my mother was just going to wire one of the maids found it in the boudoir this morning but we didn't know to whom it belonged come inside there are a lot of people staying over from last night then turning to gabrielle he added by jove what dust there must be on the road you're absolutely covered well she laughed lightly it won't hurt me i suppose i'm not afraid of it stokes took charge of the car and shut off the petrol while the three went inside passing into a long cool cloister down which was arranged the splendid collection of antiques discovered or acquired by malcolm murray the well-known antiquary who had spent many years in italy and died in seventeen ninety four in cases ranged down each side of the long cloister with its antique carved chairs armor and statuary were rare etruscan and roman terracottas one containing relics from the tomb of a warrior which included a sword hilt adorned with gold and a portion of a golden crown formed of lilies in relievo of pure gold laid upon a mould of bronze another case was full of bronze ornaments unearthed near albano and still another contained rare abyssinian curios the collection was renowned among antiquaries and was often visited by sir henry who would be brought there in the car by gabrielle and spent hours alone fingering the objects in the various cases sir george murray and sir henry hayburn were close friends therefore it was natural that walter the heir to the conican estate and gabrielle should often be thrown into each other's company or perhaps that the young man who for the past twelve months had been absent on a tour round the world should have loved her ever since the days when she wore short skirts and her hair down her back he had been sorely puzzled why she had not at the last moment come to the ball she had promised that she would be with them and yet she made that rather lame excuse of a headache truth to tell walter murray had during the past week been greatly puzzled at her demeanour of indifference seven days ago he had arrived in london from new york but found no letter from her awaiting him at the club as he had expected the last he had received in detroit a month before and it was strangely cold and quite unusual two days ago he had arrived home and in secret she had met him down at the end of the glen of glencardine at her wish their first meeting had been clandestine why both their families knew of their mutual affection therefore why should she now make a secret of their meeting after twelve months separation he was puzzled at her note and he was further puzzled at her attitude towards him she was cold and unresponsive when he held her in his arms and kissed her soft lips she only once returned his passionate caress and then as though it were a duty forced upon her she had however promised to come to the ball that promise she had deliberately broken though he could not understand her he made pretence of unconcern he regretted that she had not felt well last night that was all at the end of the cloister young gellity found one of lady murie's guests a girl named violet priest with whom he had danced a good deal on the previous night and at once attached himself to her leaving walter with the sweet-faced slim-waisted object of his affections 
the moment they were alone in the long cloister he asked her quickly tell me gabrielle the real reason why you did not come last night i had looked forward very much to seeing you but i was disappointed sadly disappointed i am very sorry she laughed with assumed nonchalance but i had to assist my father with some business papers your mother told everyone that you do not care for dancing he said that is untrue walter i love dancing i knew it was untrue dearest he said standing before her but why does lady hayburn go out of her way to throw cold water upon you and all your works how should i know asked the girl with a slight shrug perhaps it is because my father places more confidence in me than in her and his confidence is surely not misplaced he said i tell you frankly that i don't like lady hayburn she pretends to like you pretends he echoed yes it's all pretence but he added do tell me the real reason of your absence last night gabrielle it has worried me why worry my dear walter is it really worth troubling over i'm only a girl and as such am allowed vagaries of nerves and all that i simply didn't want to come that's all why well to tell you the truth i hate the crowd we have staying in our house they're all mother's friends and mother's friends are never mine you know he looked at her slim figure so charming in its daintiness what a dear little philosopher you've grown to be in a single year he declared we shall have you quoting friedrich nietzsche next well she laughed if you would like me to quote him i can do so i read zarathustra secretly at school one of the girls got a copy from germany do you remember what zarathustra says verily ye could wear no better masks ye present-day men than your own faces who would recognize you i hope that's not meant to be personal he laughed gazing at the girl's beautiful countenance and great luminous eyes you may take it as you like she declared with a delightfully mischievous smile i only quoted it to show you that i have read nietzsche and recollect his many truths you certainly do seem to have a gay house party at glencardine he remarked changing the subject i noticed jimmy flockhart there as usual yes he's one of mother's greatest friends she makes good use of him in every way up in town they are inseparable it seems they knew each other i believe when they were boy and girl so i've heard replied the young man thoughtfully leaning against a big glass case containing a collection of lars and penates images of jupiter hercules mercury etc used as household gods i expected that he would be dancing attendance upon her during the whole of the evening but curiously enough soon after his arrival he suddenly disappeared and was not seen again until nearly two o'clock then looking straight into the girl's fathomless eye he added do you know gabrielle i don't like that fellow beware of him neither do i but your warning is quite unnecessary i assure you he doesn't interest me in the least walter murray was silent for a moment silent as though in doubt a shadow crossed his well-cut features but only for a single second then he smiled again upon the fair-faced soft-spoken girl whom he loved so honestly and so well the woman who was all in all to him how could he doubt her she who only a year ago had out yonder in the park given him her pledge of affection and sealed it with her hot passionate kisses remembrance of those sweet caresses still lingered with him but he doubted her yes he could not conceal from himself certain very ugly facts facts within his own knowledge yet was not his own poignant jealousy misleading him was not her refusal to attend the ball perhaps due to some sudden pick or unpleasantness with her giddy stepmother was it he only longed to be able to believe that it might be so alas however he had discovered the shadow of a strange and disagreeable truth End of chapter 5「Chapter Six of the House of Whispers by William Lacroix. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Concerns Gabrielle's Secret. Along the cloister they went to the great hall, where Walter's mother advanced to greet her, full of regrets at the girl's inability to attend the dance. She handed her the missing bracelet, saying, It is such a curious and unusual one, dear, that we wondered to whom it belonged. Brown found it when she was sweeping my boudoir this morning. Take it home to your mother, 
and suggests that she has a stronger clasp put on it the girl held the golden snake in her open hand this was the first time she had ever seen it a fine example of old italian workmanship it was made flexible with its flat head covered with diamonds and two bright emeralds for the eyes the mouth could be opened and within was a small cavity where a photo or any tiny object could be concealed where her mother had picked it up she could not tell but lady heyburn was always purchasing quaint odds and ends and like most giddy women of her class was extraordinarily fond of fantastic jewellery and ornaments such as other women did not possess several members of the house party at conacan entered and chatted all being full of the success of the previous night's entertainment lady murray's husband had it appeared left that morning for edinburgh to attend a political committee a little later walter succeeded in getting gabrielle alone again in a small well-furnished room leading off the library a room in which she had passed many happy hours with him before he had gone abroad he had been in london reading for the bar but had spent a good deal of his time up in perthshire or at least all he possibly could at such times they were inseparable but after he had been called there being no necessity for him to practise he being heir to the estates he had gone to india and japan to broaden his mind as his father had explained i wonder gabrielle he said hesitatingly holding her hand as they stood at the open window i wonder if you will forgive me if i put a question to you i i know i ought not to ask he stammered but it is only because i love you so well dearest that i ask you to tell me the truth the truth echoed the girl looking at him with some surprise though turning just a trifle paler he thought the truth about what about that man james flockhart was his low distinct reply about him why my dear walter she laughed whatever do you want to know about him you know all that i know we were agreed long ago that he is not a gentleman weren't we yes he said don't you recollect our talk at your house in london two years ago soon after you came back from school do you remember what you then told me she flushed slightly at the recollection i ought not to have said that she exclaimed hurriedly i was only a girl then and i well i didn't know what you said has never passed my lips dearest only i ask you again to-day to tell me honestly and frankly whether your opinion of him has in any way changed i mean whether you still believe what you then said she was silent for a few moments her lips twitched nervously and her eyes stared blankly out of the window no i repeat what i said then she answered in a strange hoarse voice and only you yourself suspect the truth you are the only person to whom i have mentioned it and i have been filled with regret ever since i had no right to make the allegation walter i should have kept my secret to myself there was surely no harm in telling me dearest he exclaimed still holding her hand and looking fixedly into those clear blue fathomless eyes so very dear to him you know too well that i would never betray you but if he knew if that man ever knew she cried he would avenge himself upon me i know he would but what have you to fear little one he asked surprised at the sudden change in her you know how my mother hates me how they all detest me all except dear old dad who is so terribly helpless misled defrauded and tricked as he daily is by those about him i know darling said the young man i know it all only too well trust in me and bending he kissed her softly upon the lips what was the real the actual truth he wondered was she still his as she had ever been or was she playing him false little did the girl dream of the extent of her lover's knowledge of certain facts which she was hiding from the world vainly believing them to be her own secret little did she dream how very near she was to disaster walter murray had after a frivolous youth developed at the age of six-and-twenty into as sound honest and upright a young man as could be found beyond the border as full of high spirits as of high principles he was in every way worthy the name of the gallant family whose name he bore a murray of conacan both for physical strength and scrupulous honesty while his affection for gabrielle heyburn was that deep 
all-absorbing devotion which makes men sacrifice themselves for the women they love he was not very demonstrative he never wore his heart upon his sleeve but deep within him was that true affection which caused him to worship her as his idol to him she was peerless among women and her beauty was unequalled her piquant mischievousness amused him as a girl she had always been fond of tantalizing him and did so now yet he knew her fine character how deeply devoted she was to her afflicted father and how full of discomfort was her dull life now that she had exchanged her school for the same roof which covered sir henry's second wife indeed this latter event was the common talk of all who knew the family they sighed and pitied poor sir henry it was all very sad they said but there their sympathy ended during walter's absence abroad something had occurred what that something was he had not yet determined gabrielle was not exactly the same towards him as she used to be his keen sensitiveness told him this instinctively and indeed he had made a discovery that though he did not admit it now had staggered him he stood there at the open window chatting with her but what he said he had no idea his one thought the one question which now possessed him was whether she still loved him or whether the discovery he had made was the actual and painful truth tall and good-looking clean-shaven and essentially easy-going he stood before her with his dark eyes fixed upon her eyes full of devotion for was she not his idol she was telling him of a garden party which her mother had arranged for the following thursday and pressing him to attend it i'm afraid i may have to be in london that day dearest he responded but if i may i'll come over to-morrow and play tennis will you be at home in the afternoon no she declared promptly with a mischievous laugh i shan't i shall be in the glen by the first bridge at four o'clock and shall wait for you there very well i'll be there he laughed but why should we meet in secret like this when everybody knows of our engagement well because i have a reason she replied in a strained voice a strong reason you've grown suddenly shy afraid of chaff it seems my mother is i fear not altogether well disposed towards you walter was her quick response dad is very fond of you as you well know but lady heyburn has other views for me i think and is that the only reason you wish to meet me in secret he asked she hesitated became slightly confused and quickly turned the conversation into a different channel a fact which caused him increased doubt and reflection yes something certainly had occurred that was vividly apparent a gulf lay between them again he looked straight into her beautiful face and fell to wondering what could it all mean so true had she been to him so sweet her temperament so high all her ideals that he could not bring himself to believe ill of her he tried to fight down those increasing doubts he tried to put aside the naked truth which had arisen before him since his return to england he loved her yes he loved her and would think no ill of her until he had proof actual and indisputable as far as the eligibility of walter murray was concerned there was no question even lady heyburn could not deny it when she discussed the matter over the teacups with her intimate friends the family of the murrays of Conachan claimed a respectable antiquity the original surname of the family was de ballenhard assumed from an estate of that name in the county of forfar sir jocelynus de baldindard or ballenhard who witnessed several charters between twelve o four and twelve twenty five is the first recorded of the name but there is no documentary proof of descent before that time and indeed most of the family papers having been burned in fourteen fifty two little remains of the early history beyond the names and succession of the possessors of ballenhard from about twelve fifty till thirteen fifty which are stated in a charter of david too now preserved in the british museum this charter records the grant made by william de mall to john de ballenhard filio e heredi quandam joannes fili christiani fili joannes de ballenhard of the lands of murray in the county of perthshire and from that period about thirteen fifty the family has borne the name of de murray instead of de ballenhard in fourteen o nine duthoc du murray obtained a charter of the castle of conican possession of which has been held by the family uninterruptedly ever since except for about thirty years 
when the lands were under forfeiture on account of the rebellion of seventeen fifteen near creef junction stationed the lands of glencardine and conachan marched together therefore both sir henry hayburn and his friend sir george murray had looked upon an alliance between the two houses as quite within the bounds of probability if the truth were told gabrielle had never looked upon any other man save walter with the slightest thought of affection she loved him with the whole strength of her being during that twelve long months of absence he had been daily in her thoughts and his constant letters she had read and re-read dozens of times she had since she left school met many eligible young men at houses to which her mother had grudgingly taken her young men who had been nice to her flattered her and flirted with her but she had treated them all with coquettish disdain for in the world there was but one man who was her lover and her hero her old friend walter murray at this moment as they were together in that cosy well-furnished room she became seized by a twinge of conscience she knew quite well that she was not treating him as she ought she had not been at all enthusiastic at his return and she had inquired but little about his wanderings indeed she had treated him with a studied indifference as though his life concerned her but little and yet if he only knew the truth she thought if he could only see that that cool unresponsive attitude was forced upon her by circumstances if he could only know how quickly her heart throbbed when he was present and how dull and lonely all became when he was absent she loved him ah yes as truly and devotedly as he loved her but between them there had fallen a dark grim shadow one which at all hazards and by every subterfuge she must endeavour to hide she loved him and could therefore never bear to hear his bitter reproaches or to witness his grief he worshipped her would that he did not she thought she must hide her secret from him as she was hiding it from all the world he was speaking she answered him calmly yet mechanically he wondered what strange thoughts were concealed beneath those clear wide-open childlike eyes which he was trying in vain to fathom what would he have thought had he known the terrible truth that she had calmly and after long reflection resolved to court death death by her own hand rather than face the exposure with which she had that previous night had been threatened End of chapter six chapter seven of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain contains curious confidences a week had gone by stuart the lean thin-faced headkeeper who spoke with such a strong accent that guests from the south often failed to understand him and who never seemed to sleep so vigilant was he over the glencardine shootings had reported the purchase of a couple of new pointers therefore one morning lady hayburn and her constant cavalier flockhart had walked across to the kennels close to the castle to inspect them at the end of the big old-fashioned stable-yard with grey stone outbuildings ranged down either side and the ancient mounting block a conspicuous object were ranged the modern iron kennels full of pointers and spaniels in that big old paved quad wrangle the cobbles of which were nowadays stained by the oil and of noisy motor-cars many a gram of glencardine had mounted to ride into stirling or edinburgh or to drive in his coach to far-off london the stables were now empty but the garage adjoining whence came the odour of petrol contained the two glencardine cars besides three others belonging to members of that merry irresponsible house party the inspection of the pointers was a mere excuse on her ladyship's part to be alone with flockhart she wished to speak with him and with that object suggested that they should take the by-road which crossing one of the main roads through the estate led through a leafy wood away to a railway level crossing half a mile off the road was unfrequented and they were not likely to meet any of the guests for some were away fishing others had motored into stirling and at least three had walked down into the octeradar to take a telegram for their blind host well my dear jimmy asked the well-preserved fair-haired woman in short brown skirt and fresh white cotton blouse and sun hat what have you discovered very little replied the easy-going man 
who wore a suit of rough heather tweed and a round cloth fishing hat my information is unfortunately very meagre you have watched carefully well what have you found out that she's just as much in love with him as before the little fool and i suppose he's just as devoted to her as ever eh of course since you've been away these last few days he's been over here from conakin on one pretext or another every day of course i've been compelled to ask him to lunch for i can't afford to quarrel with his people although i hate the whole lot of them his mother gives herself such airs and his father is the most terrible old bore in the whole country but the match would be an advantageous one wouldn't it suggested the man strolling at her side and he stopped to light a cigarette which he took from a golden case advantageous of course it would but we can't afford to allow it my dear jimmy think what such an alliance would mean to us to you you mean to you also an ugly revelation might result remember therefore it must not be allowed while walter was abroad all was pretty plain sailing lots of the letters she wrote him i secured from the post-box read them and afterwards burned them but now he's back there is a distinct peril he's a cute young fellow remember flockhart smiled we must discover a means by which to part them he said slowly but decisively i quite agree with you that to allow the matter to go any further would be to court disaster we have a good many enemies you and i winnie many who would only be too pleased and eager to rake up that unfortunate episode and i for one have no desire to figure in a criminal dock nor have i she declared quickly but if i went there you would certainly accompany me he said looking straight at her what she gasped in quick dismay you would tell the truth and and denounce me i would not but no doubt there are others who would was his answer for a few moments her arched brows were knit and she remained silent her reflections were uneasy ones she and the man at her side who for years had been her confidant and friend were both in imminent peril of exposure their relations had always been purely platonic therefore she was not afraid of any allegation against her honor what her enemies had said were lies all of them her fear lay in quite a different direction her poor blind helpless husband was in ignorance of that terrible chapter of her own life a chapter which she had believed to be closed for ever and yet which was by means of a chain of unexpected circumstances in imminent danger of being reopened well she inquired at last in a blank voice and who are those others who you believe would be prepared to denounce me certain persons who envy you your position and who perhaps think that you do not treat poor old sir henry quite properly but i do treat him properly she declared vehemently if he prefers the society of that chit of a girl of his to mine how can i possibly help it besides people surely must know that to me the society of a blind old man is not exactly conducive to gaiety i would only like to put those women who malign me into my place for a single year perhaps they would become even more reckless of the conveniences than i am my dear winnie he said what's the use of discussing such an old and threadbare theme things are not always what they seem as the man with a squint said when he thought he saw two sovereigns where there was but one the point before us is the girl's future it lies in your hands was her sharp reply no in yours i have promised to look after walter murray but how can i act she asked the little hussy cares nothing for me only sees me at table and spends the whole of her day with her father act as i suggested last week was his rejoinder if you did that the old man would turn her out of the place and the rest would be easy enough but ah he laughed derisively i see you've some sympathy with the girl after all very well take the consequences it is she who will be your deadliest enemy remember she who if the disaster falls will give evidence against you therefore you'd best act now ere it's too late unless of course you are in fear of her i don't fear her cried the woman her eyes flashing defiance why do you taunt me like this you haven't told me yet what took place on the night of the ball nothing the mystery is just as complete as ever she defied you eh her companion nodded then how do you now intend to act that's just the question i was about to put to you he said there is a distinct peril 
one which becomes graver every moment that the girl and young murray are together how are we to avert it by parting them then act as i suggested the other day it's the only way winnie depend on it the only way to secure our own safety and what would the world say of me her stepmother if it were known that i had done such a thing you've never yet cared for what the world said why should you care now besides it never will be known i should be the only person in the secret and for my own sake it isn't likely that i'd give you away is it you've trusted me before he added why not again it would break my husband's heart she declared in a low intense voice remember he is devoted to her he would never recover from the shock and yet the other night after the ball you said you were prepared to carry out the suggestion in order to save yourself he remarked with a covert sneer perhaps i was piqued that she should defy my suggestion that she would go to the ball no you were not you never intended her to go that you know when he spoke to her this man never minced matters the woman was held by him in a strange thraldom which surprised many people yet to all it was a mystery the world knew nothing of the fact that james flockhart was without a penny and that he lived lived well too upon the charity of lady heyburn two thousand pounds were placed in secret every year to his credit from her ladyship's private account at coutts besides which he received odd cheques from her whenever his needs required to his friends he posed as an easy-going man about town in possession of an income not large but sufficient to supply him with both comforts and luxuries he usually spent the london season in his cosy chambers in half moon street the winter at monte carlo or at cairo the summer at aix vichy or marenbad and the autumn in a series of visits to houses in scotland he was not exactly a ladies man courtly refined and a splendid linguist as he was the girls always voted him great fun but from the elder ones and from married women especially he somehow held himself aloof his one woman friend as everybody knew was the flighty go-ahead lady heyburn of the country house party he was usually the life and soul no man could invent so many practical jokes or carry them on with such refinement of humour as he therefore if the hostess wished to impart merriment among her guests she sought out and sent a pressing invitation to jimmy flockhart a first-class shot an excellent tennis player a good golfer and quite a good hand at putting a stone in curling he was an all-round sportsman who was sure to be highly popular with his fellow guests hence up in the north his advent was always welcomed with loud approbation to those who knew him and knew him well this confidential conversation with the woman whose platonic friendship he had enjoyed through so many years would certainly have caused greatest surprise that he was a schemer was entirely undreamed of that he was attracted by winnie hayburn was declared to be only natural in view of the age and affliction of her own husband cases such as hers are often regarded with a very lenient eye they had reached the level crossing where beside the line of the caledonian railway stands the mail apparatus by which the down mail for ouston picks up the local bag without stopping while the up mail drops its letters and parcels into the big strong net for a few moments they halted to watch the dining car express for ouston pass with a roar and a crash as she dashed down the incline towards creef junction then as they turned again towards the house he suddenly exclaimed look here winnie we've got to face the music now every day increases our peril if you are actually afraid to act as i suggest then tell me frankly and i'll know what to do i tell you quite openly that i have neither desire nor intention to be put into a hole by this confounded girl she has defied me therefore she must take the consequences how do you know that your action the other night has not aroused her suspicions ah there you are quite right it may have done so if it has then our peril has very considerably increased that's just my argument but we'll have walter to reckon with in any case he loves her bah leave the boy to me i'll soon show him that the girl is not worth a second thought replied flockhart with nonchalant air all you have to do is to act as i suggested the other night then leave the rest to me and suppose it were discovered asked the woman whose face had grown considerably paler well suppose the worst happened and it were discovered 
he asked raising his brows slightly should we be any worse off than would be the case if this girl took it into her head to expose us if the facts which she could prove placed us side by side in an as-size court the woman clever scheming ambitious was silent the question admitted of no reply she recognized her own peril the picture of herself arraigned before a judge with that man beside her rose before her imagination and she became terrified that slim pale-faced girl her husband's child stood between her and her own honor her own safety once the girl was removed she would have no further fear no apprehension no hideous forebodings concerning the imminent future she saw it all as she walked along that moss-grown forest road her eyes fixed straight before her the tempter at her side had urged her to commit a dastardly and unpardonable crime in that man's hands she was alas as wax he poured into her ear a vivid picture of what must inevitably result should gabrielle reveal the ugly truth at the same time calmly watching the effect of his words upon her upon her decision depended his whole future as well as hers what was gabrielle's life to hers asked the man point-blank that was the question which decided her decided her after long and futile resistance to promise to commit the act which he had suggested she gave the man her hand in pledge then a slight smile of triumph played about his cruel nether lip and the pair retraced their steps towards the castle in silence End of chapter seven chapter eight of the house of whispers by william lacroix this librivox recording is in the public domain casting the bait loving and perishing these have tallied from eternity love and death walk hand in hand the will to love means also to be ready for death gabrielle hayburn recognized this truth she had the will to love and she had the resolve to perish perish by her own hand rather than allow her secret to be exposed those who knew her a young athletic merry-faced open-air girl on the verge of budding womanhood so true-hearted frank and free little dreamed of the terrible nature of that secret within her young heart she held aloof from her lover as much as she dared true walter came to glencardine nearly every day but she managed to avoid him whenever possible why because she knew her own weakness she feared being compelled by his stronger nature and by the true affection which she held him to confess they walked together in the cool shady glen beside the rippling burn climbed the neighboring hills played tennis or else she lay in the hammock at the edge of the lawn while he lounged at her side smoking cigarettes she did all this because she was compelled her most enjoyable hours were the quiet ones spent at her father's side alone in the library she read to him in french those curious business documents which came so often by registered post they were so strangely worded that not knowing their true import she failed to understand them all were neatly typed without any heading to the paper sometimes a printed address in the boulevard des capucines paris would appear on letters accompanying the enclosures but all were very formal and to gabrielle extremely puzzling sir henry always took the greatest precaution that no one should obtain sight of these confidential reports or overhear them read by his daughter before she sat down to read she always shot the small brass bolt on the door to prevent hill or any other intruder from entering more than once the baronet's wife had wanted to come in while the reading was in progress whereupon sir henry always excused himself saying that he locked his door against his guests when he wished to be alone an explanation which her ladyship accepted these strangely worded reports in french always puzzled the baronet's daughter sometimes she became seized by a vague suspicion that her father was carrying on some business which was not altogether honourable why should he enjoin such secrecy why should he cause her to write and dispatch with her own hand such curiously worded telegrams addressed always to the registered address metfaro paris those neatly typed pages which she read could be always construed in two or three senses but only her father knew the actual meaning which the writer intended to convey for hours she would often be engaged in reading them sometimes too telegrams in cipher arrived 
and she would then obtain the little dark blue covered book from the safe and by its aid decipher the messages from the french capital questions curious questions were frequently asked by the anonymous sender of the reports and to these her father replied by means of his private code she had become during the past year quite an expert typist and therefore to her the baronet entrusted the replies always impressing upon her the need of absolute secrecy even from her mother my affairs he often declared concern nobody but myself i trust in you gabrielle dear to guard my secrets from prying eyes i know that you yourself must often be puzzled but that is only natural unfamiliar as the girl was with business in any form she had during the past year arrived at the conclusion after much debate within herself that this source of her father's income was a distinctly mysterious one the estates were of course large and he employed agents to manage them but they could not produce that huge income which she knew he possessed for had she not more than once seen the amount of his balance at his bankers as well as the large sum he had on deposit the source of his colossal wealth was a mystery but was no doubt connected with his curious and constant communications with paris at rare intervals a grey-faced grey-bearded and rather stout frenchman a certain m goslin called and on such occasions was closeted for a long time alone with sir henry evidently discussing some important affair in secret to her ladyship as well as to gabrielle the frenchman was most courteous but refused the pressing invitations to remain the night he always arrived by the morning train from perth and left for the south the same night the express being stopped for him by signal at octeradar station the mysterious visitor puzzled gabrielle considerably her father entrusted him with secrets which he withheld from her and this often caused her both surprise and annoyance like every other girl she was of course full of curiosity towards her flockhart became daily more friendly on two occasions after breakfast he had invited her to spend an hour or two fishing for trout in the burn which was unexpectedly in spate and they had thus been some time in each other's company she however regarded him with distinct distrust he was undeniably good-looking nonchalant and a thorough-going man of the world but his intimate friendship with lady heyburn prevented her from regarding him as a true friend towards her he was ever most courteous and paid her many little compliments he tied her flies he fitted her rod and if her line became entangled in the trees he always put matters right not however that she could not do it all by herself in her strong high fishing boots her short skirts hemmed with leather her burberry and her dark blue tam o shanter set jauntily on her chestnut hair she very often fished alone and made quite respectable baskets to wade into the burn and disentangle her line from beneath the stone was to her quite a small occurrence for she would never let either stuart or any of the underkeepers accompany her why flockhart had so suddenly sought her society she failed to discern hitherto though always extremely polite he had treated her as a child which she naturally resented at length however he seemed to have realized that she now possessed the average intelligence of a young woman he had never repeated those strange words he had uttered when on the night of the ball at conican he returned in secret to the castle and beckoned her out upon the lawn he had indeed never referred to his curious action sometimes she wondered so changed was his manner whether he had actually forgotten the incident altogether he had showed himself in his true colours that night whatever suspicions she had previously held were corroborated in that stroll across the lawn in the dark shadow his tactics had altered it seemed and their objective puzzled her it must be very dull for you here miss heyburn he remarked to her one bright morning as they were casting up stream near one another they were standing not far from a rustic bridge in a deep leafy glen where the sunshine penetrated here and there through the canopy of leaves beneath which the burn pursued its sinuous course towards the urn the music of the rippling waters over the brown moss-grown boulders mingled with the rustle of the leaves above 
as now and then the soft wind swept up the narrow valley they were treading a carpet of wild flowers and the air was full of the delicious perfume of the summer day you must be very dull living here so much and going up to town so very seldom he said oh dear no she laughed you are quite mistaken i really enjoy a country life it's so jolly after the confinement and rigorous rules of school one is free up here i can wear my old clothes and go cycling fishing shooting curling in fact i am my own mistress that i shouldn't be if i lived in london and had to make calls walk in the park go shopping sit out concerts and all that sort of thing but though you're out you never go anywhere surely that's unusual for one so active and well he hesitated i wonder whether i might be permitted to say so so good-looking as you are gabrielle ah replied the girl protesting but blushing at the same time you're poking fun at me mr flockhart all i can reply is first that i am not good-looking and secondly i am not in the least dull perhaps i should be if i hadn't my father's affairs to attend to they seem to take up a lot of your time he said with pretended indifference but to his annoyance landed a salmon par at the same moment we worked together most evenings was her reply the question which he then put as he threw the par back into the burn struck her as curious it was evident that he was endeavouring to learn from her the nature of her father's correspondence but she was shrewd enough to parry all his ingenuous cross-questioning her father's secrets were her own some ill-natured people gossip about sir henry he remarked presently as he made another long cast upstream and allowed the flies to be carried down to within a few yards from where he stood they say that his source of income is mysterious and that it is not altogether open and above board what she exclaimed looking at him quickly and who pray mr flockhart makes this allegation against my father oh i really don't know who started the gossip the source of such tales is always difficult to discover some enemy no doubt every man in this world of ours has enemies what do you mean by the source of dad's income not being an honourable one the man shrugged his shoulders i really don't know he declared i only repeat what i've heard once or twice up in london tell me exactly what they say demanded the girl with quick interest her companion hesitated for a few seconds well whatever has been said i've always denied for as you know i am a friend of both lady heyburn and of your father the girl's nostrils dilated slightly friend why was not this man her father's false friend was he not behind every sinister action of lady heyburn's and had not she herself with her own ears one day at park street four years ago overheard her ladyship express a dastardly desire in the words oh henry is such a dreadful old bore and so utterly useless that it's a shame a woman like myself should be tied up to him fortunately for me he already has one foot in the grave otherwise i couldn't tolerate this life at all those cruel words of her stepmother's spoken to this man who was at that moment her companion recurred to her she recollected too flockhart's reply this hollow pretense of friendship angered her she knew that the man was her father's enemy and that he had united with the clever scheming woman in some ingenuous conspiracy against the poor helpless man therefore she turned and facing him boldly she said i wish mr flockhart that you would please understand that i have no intention to discuss my father or his affairs the latter concern himself alone he does not even speak of them to his wife therefore why should strangers evince any interest in them because there are rumours rumours of a mystery and mysteries are always interesting and attractive was his answer true she said meaningly just as rumours concerning certain of my father's guests possess an unusual interest for him mr flockhart though my father may be blind his hearing is still excellent and he is aware of much more than you think the man glanced at her for an instant and his face darkened the girl's ominous words filled him with vague apprehension was it possible that the blind man had any suspicion of what was intended he held his breath and made another vicious cast far up the rippling stream End of chapter eight